Good morning uh, and welcome to our second In Focus session. Uh, my name is Sally Hodder and I have the privilege of directing the West Virginia Clinical and Translational Science Institute. One of our favorite activities is the annual meeting, which unfortunately we could not do in person this year. And so uh, in place of that, we are conducting a series of content specific sessions. Uh, and this is the second session in that series. Before I introduce uh, the speaker, I'd like to thank folks who are here uh, in our CTSI conference room, uh, socially distanced, masked. And I'd really like to, to thank Stephanie Ballard Conrad, uh, Ashley uh, Marich, uh, and Mitra Matasha, who are here and have really facilitated the uh, tech part of this. So thank you very, very much. Uh, today's subject is uh, COVID-19, uh, and we are, are really delighted uh, to have our keynote speaker who, uh, of course, needs no introduction. Uh, Dr. Fauci is uh, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease and has been so since 1984. He has served uh, six presidents. He is, I would say, without a doubt, the world's leader in infectious disease. And I think really two, you know, sort of vignettes, uh, I, I think really describe Tony's uh, sort of vision and understanding. And the first is he was faced in the 1980s with the AIDS epidemic. There was not an established trials network. Um, advocates, rightly so, were demonstrating, were chaining themselves to the gates of the FDA. And uh, uh, Dr. Fauci embraced that. He started the uh, AIDS trial networks, which are among the most effective trial networks ever. And I think really set the stage for that. Most importantly, he brought community in and every protocol has a community member uh, on it in the HIV AIDS world. And I can say from having been a protocol chair in, in one of the networks, uh, that was the most valuable uh, sort of person on the team. Uh, the second really dates to uh, January 2020. January 18th, I again was privileged to be on NIID uh, Advisory Council. Uh, I looked forward to that because Dr. Fauci would give an hour on what's new in infectious disease. And on January 18th, last January, before really, you know, SARS-CoV-2 hit the headlines, he, he said, this will be an issue. We have sequenced it we have vaccine candidates in animals. And that was January 18th. And I think that his vision, you know, obviously uh, uh, was born out. Uh, he is actually one of the top 50 individuals who is quoted on Google. Uh, and he is a member of the National Academy of Science. Dr. Fauci, uh, I communicated with him last week. He uh, sends his regrets, but he taped remarks for us. Uh, he, I think his boss, you know how bosses are, Francis Collins actually uh, pulled him to do a, a vaccine uh, sort of program and, and we all have bosses and when they call you jump. So even Dr. Fauci uh, does that. Uh, I just wanna sort of, before we uh, uh, start his taped remarks is just give you a little idea of the format. After Dr. Fauci's uh, talk, Dr. Lee, who is the director of the IDEA program, will tell us a little bit about NIH uh, diagnostic initiatives. And then we are really delighted to have Dr. Marsh, my boss, as well as Secretary Crouch to talk about the implications for West Virginia. Our second hour will transition to three of our best investigators talking about their cutting edge science relevant to COVID-19. So we'll start with Dr. Fauci's remarks. Greetings, my name is Tony Fauci, and it's a great pleasure to speak to the West Virginia Clinical and Translation Science Institute. I would like to thank my good friend, Sally Hodder, for the kind invitation and for the opportunity to speak to you today about COVID-19. As shown on this first slide, the title of my talk is The Public Health and Scientific Challenges Associated with the Historic 
pandemic of COVID-19 that we are currently experiencing. This slide is a shot of the cover of JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, of a viewpoint that my colleagues and I wrote and published in January of this year. And as you can see from the title, it is coronavirus infections more than just the common cold. And I chose this title not to be facetious, but to remind the readers that we have had decades of experience with coronaviruses. In fact, if you look at this phylogenetic tree of the coronaviruses, you see that the human coronaviruses are in red letters, but also bats, for example, are very important reservoirs of coronaviruses. And they, in fact, have viruses that are strikingly similar to those that have infected humans. In the yellow highlighted boxes are the four coronaviruses that account for anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of the common colds that each of us experience repetitively year after year, particularly during the winter months. However, that all changed in 2002 and then again in 2012 when we were confronted with the first pandemic coronaviruses. That what was known as SARS in 2002 and MERS in 2012. So the severe acute respiratory syndrome was caused by a novel coronavirus that had pandemic, pandemic potential and in reality created a pandemic of about 8,000 cases and close to 800 deaths, a high degree of mortality, but was not particularly efficient in spreading from human to human. And so it was controlled completely by public health measures like identification, isolation, contact tracing, and quarantine. 10 years later, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, again, a coronavirus of pandemic potential, erupted in the Middle East and Saudi Arabia. It is still to this day having reintroductions. The, the original SARS was from a bat to a civet cat to a human, and the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome was felt to be a bat to a camel to a human. Now, where are we today? The third pandemic coronavirus, the syndrome of which appeared in the Guang, in the uh, Wuhan district of China in, the, in December of 2019. The Chinese identified this as a novel coronavirus in the first week of January of 2020. And here we see it on the phylogenetic tree and notice that because of its proximity phylogenetically to the original SARS that I mentioned a moment ago, it got the terminology SARS coronavirus 2 and the original SARS was called SARS coronavirus 1. And in fact, just to be clear on the terminology, the disease itself is called COVID-19 or coronavirus disease 2019 for the recognition of this new disease in December of 2019. And as I mentioned a moment ago, the virus that causes this syndrome is called SARS coronavirus 2. What is this virus doing to our planet? It has exploded in a manner that is unprecedented in the last 102 years since the 1918 infamous Spanish flu. With, as of just literally a few days ago, we had 40 million cases globally and 1.1 million deaths. The United States of America has been the worst hit country in the world with 8.1 million cases and over 218,000 deaths. The heat map of the states shown here indicate the number of cases per 100,000 population. Now I wanna take a minute or two to talk a little bit about the difference between the United States outbreak and the outbreak in the European Union because it tells us a bit about responsiveness and the kinds of things that are going on now and that will go on. If you look at the blue line, the European Union peaked particularly with the outbreak in Northern Italy, France, and then Spain with uh, cases that are shown plotted here on the blue line. Note that when they recovered and shut down, they went down to a baseline less than 10,000 per day. In the United States, 
in which the peak early on was based predominantly on infections in the New York metropolitan area. As you could see, they peaked, but when they recovered, particularly the, the outbreak that was driven by the New York metropolitan area that accounted at one point in the spring to about 40% of the infections, hospitalizations, and deaths. When they recovered, however, our baseline in the United States did not go down below uh, 20,000. As you can see, it hovered around there. That was due to the fact that there was eruptions in other parts of the country with community spread. When we tried to open up the country, as it were, the, the guidelines that were put forth in opening America again that were variably adhered to, we had a surge of cases that brought that baseline to about 70,000 a day, recovered a little bit, and now most recently, with the surges that we're seeing, we're averaging between 55 and 65,000 cases a day. Take a look at the European Union that did very well for several months, but then again, as the weather got a bit colder, and even before then, as they try to open up their economy, they skyrocketed up now to the European Union having over 88,000 cases a day. But the question is going back to April, May, and June, why did the United States never get down to a baseline that approximated that in the European Union? It depends really on, at least in part, to the extent in which one shuts down the country. If you look using GPS at mobility over time, for example, in parks and outdoor spaces, the United States did not shut down nearly as much as Italy and Spain as shown in the light lines compared to the dark line. If you look at things like workplaces, again, the United States did not shut down as much as Italy and Spain as a representative of the European Union. This was also very clearly seen when one looked at visits to grocery stores and pharmacies, again, where the United States did not shut down nearly as much as Italy and Spain. So that gives you a snapshot of the different dynamics and the different approaches from an epidemiological and public health standpoint in those two important regions of the globe. Let's take a quick look at the virology, as I mentioned and shown on a previous slide. SARS coronavirus 2 is a beta coronavirus, an RNA virus with four structural genes, the most important and studied of which is the spike protein with its receptor binding domain that binds to the ACE2 receptor, which is the cellular receptor for SARS coronavirus 2. That's widely distributed in the upper and lower respiratory tract, the GI tract and other tissues such as cardiovascular tissue and some endothelial cells. The transmission as we now know is by respiratory transmission, including large droplets the kind that stay in the air for a very brief period of time, leading to the distance recommendations of six feet or more. However, recent data indicates that aerosol transmission, namely particles small enough to remain in the air for more than just a few seconds and have extended uh, flowing about over time and distances. The exact uh, degree or relative importance of aerosol um, is not entirely clear, but we know that at least is a part of the transmissibility. The virus is found in a number of different bodily fluids, but its role in transmission is unclear and likely minimal, if at all. Now, the risk of transmission varies by the type and duration of exposure, as well as other factors, such as the viral load in the upper respiratory tract. Transmissions are seen in household contacts, in congregate or even in healthcare settings where there is not available PPE or the PPE is not properly used. We also see outbreaks in closed session, in closed settings, excuse me, cruise ships, nursing homes, prisons, and factors that may increase the risk of airborne transmission are crowded in closed spaces, particularly in those where there's poor ventilation indoors. This becomes particularly problematic as we enter the coolest season of the fall and the colder seasons of winter. It's important to point out that you do not need to sneeze or cough to transmit. It is transmitted by singing, by speaking loudly, or even by breathing heavily. This graph from the CDC shows some of the risk places where transmissibility occurs. 
particularly restaurants that are closed and at full capacity with poor ventilation, gyms, bars and coffee shops, as well as certain religious gatherings. A very important component of this infection is that about 40 to 45% of the people who are infected are in fact asymptomatic. And modeling studies show that a substantial proportion of transmissions actually occur from an asymptomatic person to an uninfected person. This leads to now the very strong recommendation that I and my colleagues have been putting forth for some time now, is that fundamentals for the prevention of the acquisition and transmission of SARS coronavirus 2, the universal wearing of masks or cloth coverings, maintaining physical distance, the six foot rule that we talk about, avoiding crowds and congregate settings. This is particularly important and even more important when you're talking about indoors. And in that regard, try to do things outdoors much more favorably than indoors. And finally, the frequent washing of hands. The clinical manifestations are protein, but the early clinical manifestations are very much similar to what we call a flu-like syndrome, as shown as the percentages on this slide. In addition, in some patients, there's a curious loss of smell and taste which precedes the onset of the respiratory symptoms. Now, for those who do develop symptoms, they are mild to moderate in about 80% of individuals. By mild to moderate, we, need, we mean not necessarily requiring any medical intubation except staying home and out of society. However, about 15 to 20% of people have severe or critical manifestations. And in those, the case fatality varies from a few percent to up to 20 to 25% of those individuals who require mechanical ventilation. The manifestations of severe disease are many, the most predominant of which is acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. However, we find by further and more and more clinical experience that we're seeing unusual manifestations like severe cardiac dysfunction manifested by arrhythmias, cardiomyopathies, and sometimes sudden death with cardiac arrest, neurological disorders, kidney disease, a curious hypercoagulability manifested by microthrombi in small vessels and thromboembolic phenomenon, leading sometimes to acute strokes in otherwise healthy individuals, and a very interesting multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children Rep, which is very reminiscent of Kawasaki syndrome, seen anywhere from one to a few weeks following infection in children. In addition, we're starting to get more and more information about what's referred to as a post-COVID-19 syndrome of individuals who weeks and sometimes months or more following virological recovery report signs and symptoms such as extreme fatigue, a shortness of breath, dyspnea, particularly climbing stairs or doing exercise, a dysautonomia, temperature dysregulation, sleep disorders, as well as what individuals are referring to as brain fog or a inability to focus or concentrate. Now, the people who are at increased risk for severe COVID-19 illness, older adults, namely, if you look at this next slide, it's very telling. If you look at the rate per 100,000, rate of hospitalization per 100,000 population, as you can see here, a number of individuals in the lower age group compared to the elderly 75 years of age or over, a dramatic difference. And people of any age with certain underlying medical conditions. These are some of the conditions associated with an increased risk for COVID illness. Paramount among these are obesity, heart conditions, chronic obstructive lung disease. There are other conditions that may be associated with increased risk and they're shown on this slide. I point out diabetes mellitus, hypertension, as well as immunocompromised states due to other diseases. Very important are the racial and ethnic disparities that we see in the United States where African-American and Latinx have a higher incidence of infection in the first place usually on the basis of the jobs they generally have, putting them out in society in contact with people, and the increase of prevalence and incidence 
of the comorbidities that they have much more out of proportion compared to the general population, the comorbidities such as the underlying diseases that I mentioned a few slides ago. This is a telling slide. If you look at the rate of hospitalization per 100,000 population, the Hispanic, Latinos, American Indians, Native Americans, and Blacks in the 300 plus compared to white at 86. Therapeutics, we have established at the NIH a expert treatment guidelines panel made up of clinicians with experience in treating this disease from throughout the country and the world who meet online regularly to, to develop a living document that's updated on a regular basis, providing the latest information on the clinical management and treatment of people with COVID-19. It's easily accessible on the website shown on this slide. If you look at the therapeutics for COVID-19, if you look at the bottom part, there are some that are under clinical trials, such as antivirals, convalescent serum, hyperimmune globulin, very cautiously optimistic about the possibility of monoclonal antibodies directed against the virus. However, there are two that are actually recommended by the guidelines panel that have been tested in randomized placebo-controlled trials. For example, remdesivir in a randomized placebo-controlled trial of over 1,000 people showed a significant diminution in time to recovery of hospitalized patients who had lung involvement. Another randomized placebo-controlled trial from the United Kingdom of over 6,000 patients showed that individuals who had advanced disease, hospitalized requiring ventilation or high flow oxygen when given dexamethasone as opposed to placebo had a substantial diminution in the 28 day mortality. And finally, with regard to vaccines, we have developed what we call a strategic approach to COVID-19 vaccine research and development in which we have what's called a harmonization of the protocols. There are six candidates that are being supported directly or indirectly for trial in the United States. I'll get to them in a moment. The coordination and the collaboration and the uh, harmonization of the protocols mean that we have a common data and safety monitoring board, common primary and secondary endpoints, and common immunological uh, parameters that are used to develop correlates of immunity. These are the three separate platforms that are currently being tested in the six trials that are ongoing in the United States, nucleic acid, namely mRNA, viral vectors, chimp adenovirus or, or human adenovirus, as well as vesicular stomatitis virus, and then the protein subunits that are the classic vaccines that have been used for years. On the right-hand part of the slide, you see that there are five out of the six that I mentioned are in phase three trials, two of which began on July 27th. So I can predict, I believe with some degree of, of certainty, that by the end of November, beginning of December, we will know based on the size of the trial and the rate of infections that are ongoing in this country, we will know if we have a safe and effective vaccine. I feel cautiously optimistic that we will have a safe and effective vaccine, even though you can never make absolute predictions when it comes to vaccinology. The reason I feel cautiously optimistic is that the data from the animal models, as well as the preliminary, not preliminary, but early data that we got from the phase one trials showed that these candidates induce a degree of neutralizing antibody that is comparable, if not exceeding what we see in natural infection in convalescent plasma. I wanna close by showing this slide, which is the COVID-19 Prevention Network website that you can access to, her, to learn a bit about the trials that are going on, but also if anyone feels they would like to at least consider the possibility of entering one of these clinical trials, that you can express your interest without any obligation and learn more about this. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. for his time and his remarks. Uh, the next speaker uh, is Dr. Ming Li, who is Director of the Division of Research Capacity Building at the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. 
And in that position, he is director of the Institutional Development Award or IDEA programs uh, that actually funds the uh, CTSI. Uh, he is a distinguished scientist who uh, actually moved from uh, the National Science Foundation to NIH in 2008, and he moved to the National Institute of General Medical Sciences from the National Cancer Institute in 2018. Dr. Lee uh, has a leadership role at NIH on the what's called RADx initiative or Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics. And he is going to, to just give a few minutes of an overview about what NIH is doing on the diagnostic front. Dr. Lee. Thank you, Sally. Um, first of all, I will start off by stating something obvious. I've never uh, imagined uh, speaking right after Dr. Fauci. So I'd urge everyone to take a deep breath and reset your expectations completely. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, um, as the pandemic sweeping through the country, uh, NIH uh, stood up many initiatives uh, within a short period of time. And uh, so Sally asked me to present an overview that provided context to the various initiatives. I should have noted that West Virginia is very, very success successful in those initiatives. So I'll try to do that in less than 10 minutes. So um, as the virus started to uh, spread in February, Congress given uh, an NIH uh, pot of money primarily to support the vaccine development program that Dr. Fauci led. And at the same time, various NIH ICs reallocated their regular appropriation or budget to support urgent COVID uh, uh, research. Um, that resulted in many of the so-called noses that uh, many of you responded. A very notable success or example is the establishment of the Idea State COVID-19 registry that is anchored right here at Morgantown. So um, by April, as it became abundantly clear that testing was the bottleneck of this fight against the virus, Congress gave NIH $1.5 billion uh, to focus on strategies, effort on testing. Next slide, please. So NIH responded by stood up four initiatives or programs on, on this effort. So uh, the first two of them, RedX Tech and RedX ATP, focus on technology development to increase the capacity at different levels. The third initiative, RedX Radical, just as name stand, uh, encourage people to look for different approaches, ideas, uh, non-conventional uh, ideas. And the last one is the Radix underserved population as uh, Dr. Fauci just uh, uh, indicated that uh, the, uh, the virus really hit uh, um, ethnic minorities and the other underserved populations very hard. So next slide, please. To quickly uh, 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 tell you about the Radix uh, tag, so this was um, utilized a uh, so-called shark tank approach. So I trust every one of you will watch the TV show so you know how it works, basically to accelerate technology development. Next slide, please. So this initiative was the first uh, uh, off the ground. So by now they have founded a large number of awards to various companies to develop high throughput laboratory technologies. Next slide, please. As well as a point of care test technologies. Next slide, please. And the expectation is that by the end of the year, uh, the technology development by this initiative will quadruple the testing capacity in the nation. Next slide, please. So again, quick touch on the Radix Acts. That is to encourage people to, uh, to fund unconventional ideas. For example, uh, testing, uh, uh, wasting water testing uh, uh, to help address this public health uh, crisis. 
And uh, next slide, please. And the focus of uh, my uh, presentation today is on the radix underserved population. As I mentioned, it because of the uh, obvious disparity, so this effort focused on uh, increased testing for uh, underserved populations that include uh, racial ethnic minorities, uh, rural communities, as well as vulnerable uh, populations such as elderly. So for the $500 million we got, we put them into uh, two phases because we recognize the rapid changing of the landscape of this pandemic. So we want to have a way to make adjustment to, uh, to uh, respond more efficiently as, the, as our uh, effort progress. So we have made uh, the first round of awards and it's just about time to wrap up the first phase in uh, the next couple of weeks that that was uh, commit about $300 million uh, uh, out of this initiative. Next slide, please. So the overall strategy of the Radix up obviously first is going to uh, is to focus on increased capacity to test the uh, underserved population and uh, to reach uh, to achieve rapid impact so we used we took a, a strategy to deploy validated point of care test primarily through supplement award to established uh, programs and uh, there will be also studies to uh, understand the, what are the barriers so that it can inform our effort? And finally, to establish structure, infrastructure that will not only uh, make our current effort more effective and also will serve potentially uh, other public health crises in the future. Next slide, please. So um, as I just outlined, so the program to achieve the uh, goals that we set uh, we put in uh, structured this program in three components. The first one on the left hand is the, the most significant component that really is a national testing research network that will consume about 80% of the budget. Then there are a set of studies to focus on understanding the social, ethical, and behavior implications. Those are the understand the barriers of the testing. And finally, we organize this large national um, network through uh, coordinate, coordinating center. Next slide, please. So for the uh, first round of the phase one, altogether we made 40 awards. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the largest will be the, the testing sites. And you can see that Morgantown is on the map. Uh, that is, uh, each one of those award is a five million supplement award to reach the communities and increase testing. And uh, together, those 40 awards will be uh, organized or coordinated by, by the center at Duke. Next slide, please. So this is a basic, uh, a very simple illustration how Duke will, will accomplish this coordination. They have a leadership team, then they have a various cores focused on technology, community engagement, and data science, and that those cores and at Duke will work with each of the Reddit Ups Award, such as the one at the University of West, West Virginia University. Next slide, please. And at the end, and the, each site will share or send, submit their data, their testing data to the Duke Coordination Center. And uh, the harmonization will be there and the identification will be done there, then pass through uh, NIH-wide Radix um, data portal. And as I mentioned that one of our goals is to establish a, na a national infrastructure. And so those data are going to be uh, kept and forever for future research use. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Uh, that was very helpful. 
before we get to our audience questions, I'd like to go to our two distinguished panel mem members, our other two distinguished panel members, uh, the first of which is Dr. Clay Marsh, who again needs no introduction. Dr. Marsh is a Vice President and Executive Dean at the Health Science Center at West Virginia University, uh, coming to us from uh, the Ohio State University where he served as VP of Research. He uh, has had a distinguished career, but his current role uh, is the COVID czar in West Virginia. And it is in that role that he is here today. And let me also introduce our other distinguished member, Secretary Crouch. Uh, Secretary Crouch was named to the uh, West Virginia cabinet by Governor Justice in 2017. And he is the Secretary of Health and Human Resources. Uh, and he has worked hard uh, throughout this uh, pandemic. And I'd like to, to perhaps start with uh, Clay and have him make some comments and then we'll go to uh, Secretary Crouch. And then uh, for Dr. Lee, Dr. Marsh and Secretary Crouch, we'll take questions from the audience uh, after their remarks. So Clay. Thank you, Sally. And uh, congratulations for putting on this uh, great uh, program. Certainly having Tony Fauci as the lead off speaker is, uh, is quite a treat and, um, and I know that you have a very strong and long relationship with him. And Ming, thank you so much for your support for what we're trying to do, not only at West Virginia University, but also in the state of West Virginia. Your support and partnership uh, are incredibly meaningful at this very, very unusual time. So I wanna restrict my comments to about, you say about two hours, Sally, is that what I have? I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting. So, so just let me make a few comments. And, and we know, and, and Tony Fauci is on the, on the front page of the, of the news uh, almost every day, but he is today as well, as he is talking about the, the next phase of COVID-19, which is happening around the country and also happening in West Virginia. We know that, um, for instance, in the last week, we've seen the highest uh, weekly average of positive cases, and we've seen the two highest daily number of positive cases at any time since the beginning of this pandemic. We also know that there is a transition in the age of people that are infected today, going from you know in April where people were older to July, where the average age I think was about 35 around the country, and now where the age has gone back up into the 50s through the 70s. And as, as Dr. Fauci showed that the older people are, the more likely the severity of their illness is, and the more likely they'll be hospitalized. And in that respect, we see states like Utah that are starting to ration, contemplate rationing intensive care unit, critical care, um, uh, cities like El Paso, Texas, that are looking at being completely full. States like Wisconsin that are building field hospitals and starting to admit patients to those field hospitals. And I don't say that to create panic because as we all know, we have a tremendous power over this virus. And, and I think that the one thing that's probably not been represented as effectively as it should is this idea that if we look at countries, and I, and I just looked up Taiwan this morning. So Taiwan is a small island country of 23 million people. They have a total of 770 documented cases and they have seven deaths since the beginning of the, of the pandemic. And it, I think it just goes to show if you have a committed people and an effective infrastructure in public health, and people do the protective things, the, the, our power against the virus, then we can control the virus. And I've read that if you have over 90% of people wearing face masks effectively, correctly, and physically distancing, then the impact on our reproductive value, the rate of spread of the virus is, is as good, if not better than a vaccine, and it is immediately at our disposal. So, so I think as we go forward, you know, there's a lot of, of, of very pessimistic 
depressive, you know, depressing uh, information that is circulated all the time. But, but to me, the great news is that this is where having a community, a state where people care about each other, where we're used to service. I mean, we have one of the highest per capita veterans populations in the country. We have gone underground to mine the coal to you know, build the, the, the steel for the war effort and for the industrial revolution. And we understand what community and neighbor and service and altruism, we understand what that's about. And it is time for us to be able to move to the level that we can demonstrate what that level of commitment can translate to, to control the generational pandemic you know, of, of our lifetime. And as you look at the flu epidemic in 1918, H1N1 Spanish flu, then this is the phase that was the, the hardest and, and what had the most deaths associated with it. And so I think going into a, a time where people are gonna be inside, where we're gonna come together, where we're gonna see each other, you know, where we can infect each other person to person easier, it is really a tremendous time to demonstrate what we can contribute and be that sort of bearer for the rest of the country. Because if we do simple things correctly, if we get tested to identify the pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic spreaders, and there's more being identified about these quote unquote spreaders, super spreaders all the time, which is very useful, and wear our mask and physically distance, and we are able to continue to do our contact tracing, we can make it through this, not just by surviving, but by thriving, but the time is now. So I am really very optimistic about our state, but you know, with that optimism is a healthy dose of reality because we know that many states are getting into more and more trouble, but it is really our time now as a, as a, as a people, as a set of community members to not only protect ourselves, but protect our neighbors, protect our vulnerable citizens, and protect our healthcare assets. Because we also know that the more we access the healthcare you know, um, ac um, assets of the, of the state, the communities, and overwhelm that ability to take care of people that are really sick. It's not just people with COVID that get sick, it's people with heart attacks and strokes. And so really it's a matter of, of maintaining those services. So I'm looking forward to addressing any questions. I will stop my comments and I know Secretary Crouch will, will make his, um, but it's really quite a pleasure to join everybody. And thank you, Sally, for inviting me to make a few comments. Thank you. Thanks very much. Secretary Crouch, uh, would you like to make some, some opening comments? Oh, thank you, Sally uh, and Clay. Yeah, it's, it's an honor to be here. I appreciate the invitation. I, I think uh, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking uh, I'm feeling a little bit uh, like Dr. Lee following Dr. Fauci. I, uh, I follow Clay a lot. I think I've heard him talk two hours, by the way. So, uh, but I'm, it, it's, uh, it's an experience, a learning experience every time. I, I've told folks, I don't think I've ever read so many uh, scientific articles uh, in my life, and uh, they, they, it's, it hasn't slowed down much, but it used to start about 6, 6.30 in the morning. Clay would push two or three articles to, to, to the team, and, uh, and that goes on all day, and then in the evening, we usually get a couple more. So uh, when we first started this, uh, and, and it's an amazing journey, I have to say, uh, but I, I will tell you, meeting with the governor and, uh, and, and getting our team together um, was, a, it was quite an experience as well. Clay coming into that, and I, I brag on Clay all the time, but that's where I really began, this really began to impact me in terms of, of, of the scope of this disease and what we were looking forward to. Uh, not looking forward in a good way, but what we were, what we needed to plan for. And that hasn't stopped. It has been a daily chore of, of guiding the state through this process. I, I always want to give the governor credit, not for any political purpose or because there's an election coming, but he made some tough decisions early on. He made some very tough decisions. Um, you know, shutting down the state, the safe at home was a 
difficult decision. Watching, watching him deliberate over that was uh, was uh, it had an impact on on me. Uh, and and we we usually Clay and, and and Jim Hoyer and I are kind of called the the pandemic leadership. We usually agree on everything. Uh, there have been decisions though that the governor made that uh, he didn't take any of our recommendations. I've said before that. He, he always talks about listening to his, uh, his medical team and leadership, and we probably listen to him more than he listens to us. He's, uh, he's made a couple that uh, we all were scratching our heads saying, that's, uh, we don't think that's right, and then it turns out to be great. So it, the process has, has been absolutely um, intellectually um, just almost overwhelming at times, but enriching in terms of following these decisions and how they're made and 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 how they affect people. So what it comes down to now is is what Clay says. It's wearing a mask, it's distancing, it's it's the sanitation. We try to to move on these outbreaks as quickly as we can. We're looking at 145 or so outbreaks in the state right now. Uh, the numbers are, they look terrible to us because we keep wanting to push them down. But when you compare us to to other states out there, we're doing a good job. Uh, and that's because people have responded to, to Clay and the governor. And uh, I try not to speak much anymore because they're so good at it. I, 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 don't, uh, I don't need to follow, follow them in any way. So, but I appreciate being here. Sally, thank you so much for the invitation. Happy to, uh, to answer any questions I can. Hey, Bill, that may be because we don't give you any chance to speak, so. <laughs> That's fine with me. <laughs> Thank you very much. We do have some questions from our audience. Uh, and this one I think is, is for comment for Clay, which is to whom the, the question is directed. But Secretary Crouch, please feel free to chime in. And the question is, why isn't there an enforcement policy in West Virginia of wearing masks while in public? This could help a great deal to fight the pandemic. Maybe I'll start, Bill, if that's OK. Um, there was uh, there were four agent based models, mathematical models that were published in the Washington Post right at the beginning of the pandemic. And basically, the four models were uh, number one, do nothing. Number two, have rules and enforce good behavior. Number three, have people cooperate at 75 percent cooperation level. Number four, people cooperate at 90 percent cooperation level. And what they demonstrated was that the by far the best out outputs and protection, sustained uh, protection was in the cooperation models. When you enforce things, even though you might get an early uh, improvement over time, that might wane. And I think the governor has demonstrated, as, 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 uh, as Secretary Crouch has mentioned, a real proclivity toward understanding how to keep our state together. And we all would agree, I believe, at least um, I'll let Bill answer for himself since he's on the, since he's on the, uh, the Zoom. But, but one of the important considerations for our good outcomes, in my opinion, has been the ability to stay together and not fracture down the middle and have people march on the Capitol with automatic weapons as maybe we've seen in Michigan and other states. And the governor's been very, um, um, very, um, intentional about making sure that he's doing things to keep the state together. Uh, and so I think that while in some places we have seen benefits of having mask wearing laws and penalties, et cetera, I think in his judgment, that would be deleterious to the uh, outcomes that he is trying to engage with. And so he's been hesitant to do that. Uh, good news in a public health survey of at least West Virginia University, we found 85% uh, of people um, of the students wearing masks. Um, and so we feel good about that. Um, but I think that's certainly a tool in the tool belt that's still left. Bill, I'll let you add in any thoughts you might. I think that covers it pretty good. I, what I tell folks, and, and we, have, uh, we have calls from local health departments daily uh, about what can we do. Um, We've, uh, we've had folks want to do, and in many cases have done uh, wrestling matches. They, they've done uh, um, baptisms on Main Street in one of our small towns in West Virginia. We've had fairs. We've had uh, 
uh, a variety of uh, parades and, and things that uh, activities that people want to, to do because that's what they've always done and because they're tired, they want out, uh, pe people are, are weary. And we tell everybody, I tell folks, don't put yourself in harm's way. Uh, we, we've seen women get tased in other states and, and, and we've seen uh, fights and we've seen people uh, you know, spit upon. We've seen all kinds of actions that you know, don't have to happen. There, there, are, there are individuals out there who believe it's their right to, to not wear a mask and, and to do what they want. We're not going to change those, uh, those folks. And, you know, I, I, I don't talk about it a whole lot because Clay and the governor are so good at talking about it, but we don't want anyone in harm's way. So we're encouraging everyone to, to please do their part, do their part to keep themselves safe, safe keep their families safe and keep their neighbors safe. And uh, that, that's our approach. And again, our numbers are good. We, we, we have outbreaks that we know if people wore masks and, and did a little more, we, we might be able to avoid, but uh, there's only so much we can do in terms of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, and I'd like to start with Dr. Lee and then get uh, Clay and the secretary's response as well. What Research, you know, NIH has a lot of initiatives and, and Dr. Ming reviewed some of them, but what research do you see as being particularly needed in West Virginia to really contribute to, you know, sort of getting the epidemic under control? Dr. Lee? I'm not sure, is he, did we lose him? He may have not, he may have signed off, Sally, at least. Okay. Well, Clay? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, I think that, um, that what's really important is, is you know, we can, we can speculate on things that might be useful, but I think what's really very cool is we have so much research that is ongoing right now, and I, I believe that one of the beautiful things about this pandemic, and, and some people might look at that as uh, an inappropriate use of, of language, because it's caused so much heartache and trauma and, uh, and problems for so many. And I don't mean it to be disrespectful in any way, shape or form, but our community, and I mean the community now in the research environment and, and the universities have really come together to be able to serve the state and solve important problems and, and work together. And I'm looking at a bunch of people on this, this screen, and I know we have 15 screens and I could look at people on every screen, but I think that the greatness of a university or a set of universities, so the greatness of a health system is not just, you know, what your billable hours look like or what your, you know, your, your day's cash on hand or your quality metrics or your U.S. News and World Report rankings. It's really how we answer the call when it's needed and how we start to solve the important problems that are causing harm or, or illness in our people. And the goal would be as part of the United States of America would be to use West Virginia and what we're able to do as a platform and then scale and share that with anybody who we can. We wanna help people everywhere. And I think that the work Sally you're doing, the work that, that our, our physicians, healthcare workers in general are doing, that our researchers are doing all the way from our basic scientists who are starting to solve problems like creating our own COVID-19 testing capabilities to designing our new N95 protective face masks to testing decontamination protocols to our community members who are out there trying to get people to be able to get tested and to be able to give people PPE and, and to train people to the way that we're working as teams to run to the fire, as the governor says, with outbreaks in nursing homes, et cetera. It is so, so inspiring to me. And I know to, the, to Bill Crouch and to the governor and to the leadership team, because this is what real community looks like, but it's not just community supporting each other. These, this is bring all the smart people together and make great things happen. And we're seeing the benefits of that in West Virginia. So, so we are on our way 
to really demonstrate how we can all work together, how the universities, the state, the health systems, and I hope that this is a foundation, a platform that then thrives much after COVID's done so that we can really start to solve the public and population health challenges of West Virginia and the U.S. and the world. Uh, Secretary Crouch, would you like to add to that? You're muted, Bill. Sorry, I would say that's the first time I've ever done that, but I can't say that. And, uh, <laughs> Clay is just uh, is so good at, at talking about that. The, the, the real takeaway or the real piece that hits home to me is bringing all those smart people together. Uh, we have some teams, and, and I want to brag on our folks, people that uh, you, you probably will never know who are public servants who are working 16, 18 hours a day, and, and that's virtually every day. I mean, it doesn't end on, on weekends. We're, we're taking calls. I've been on calls uh, the last two nights at uh, 9 o'clock at night, uh, 9.30 at night, trying to deal with issues. So we have a lot of smart people in this state, and, and uh, we have a lot of smart people in DHHR, and they're really stepping up. We have some folks who have done a great job and are doing a great job to help uh, help move us forward. And Clay's done, again, a, a, just a great integral piece of that. So. Thank you. We have just a couple more minutes and we have several questions that really address uh, the possible vaccine. And, and uh, Secretary Crouch, perhaps you'd wanna start. I'll just say there's, there's a question that says, what is the anticipated timeline? Maybe you could comment, are there any plans in the works? Uh, and then for Clay, there's also a question about you know, institutions. Uh, what is your feeling about requirements, for example, uh, WVU healthcare workers uh, having vaccine uh, required? So Secretary Crouch, do you wanna talk? Have there been some, some plans laid and discussed for West Virginia? Yeah, absolutely, Sally. We started in August uh, with a team that uh, is broad, very broad-based, from the Hospital Association, the Healthcare Association, WVU is part of that, Marshall's part of that, uh, we have the National Guard. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a good doc draft document that's uh, linked to uh, our DHHR website, if you'd like to pull that up. Um, it is very comprehensive. It's, it's well done. We talk about the priority for vaccines for, for, uh, for individuals, for our first responders. So first priority is, is going to be our uh, nursing home population and, and the staff who work there. We're trying to protect that population as much as possible. Over half of our deaths have come from nursing home uh, cases. Uh, so we, we have that priority spelled out in the document. In terms of when we're expected to, to, uh, to get a vaccine, the latest communication we have is that is now possible by, um, by the end of November, so within 30 days. Now, I think there's still questions there in terms of, of which one and, uh, and whether that time frame will be, will be met or not. We, uh, I tend to be a little more skeptical about uh, vaccines um, and, and certainly about uh, the ability to manufacture the numbers that will be needed for, for world for, for distribution. Uh, and, uh, you know, like most of these issues, uh, the, the vaccines will go uh, spread out uh, throughout based upon some criteria that will be determined. Uh, West Virginia, unfortunately, because we're 0.56% of the population, uh, we rarely get priorities. Uh, and the fact that we're doing a little better than, than most states, to me, means we may be down on the list a little bit. Uh, but we'll fight to, to get to, to the top of the list. Our, our senators in Washington have always been very helpful in, in that respect. So um, the timeline, if we get something uh, by end of November or the end of the year, we're still looking at, uh, at, at least a year in terms of manufacturing and, and getting folks who need to be vaccinated, uh, uh, vaccinated. So Clay, turn it over to you. Well, Sally, you asked me the question, which I'll answer quickly because I know we're running out of time about whether or not we would require people to be vaccinated. And I'm looking at you, Sally, an infectious disease expert, 
Arif Sawari, an infectious disease expert, Mike Edmond, who's going to join us, an infectious disease expert. And so I would be not the right person to start to talk about the policy. All I would say is that we know that an effective vaccine would be so important, not only to protect us, the individuals, but to protect the people that we're seeing from the clinical perspective. So I would imagine that there will be a strong push for people to take a safe and effective vaccine when it comes out. And I believe healthcare workers will be on the front side of that as I'm looking at some of these folks. But you know, as, as every uh, intervention goes, we would want to make sure we're doing this thoughtfully and safely and, and do it in a way we'll, where we are um, trying to work collaboratively with all the people that are part of our organization and organizations. I see many organizations represented here on the Zoom call. And so the infectious disease experts, along with our infection control people, and I saw Dr. Kaku there too, Rashida Kaku. So, so I think that those decisions will be made by real experts and then we'll understand best how to try to push that out into a uh, more easy to uptake uh, system so that we can get people vaccinated efficiently and effectively. And remember, for this year too, take your flu vaccine. Every year is an important year, but this year is the most important year. So all vaccines are important too. Back okay. to you, Sally. Okay, I want to thank, we'll close out this first hour, and I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Fauci, uh, Dr. Lee, Dr. Marsh, Secretary Crouch, for your comments uh, and all of your support. And, you know, I, I really should mention West Virginia closed public schools before New York City. And so I think the state really has done many, many things right. Uh, there's many more things to do right, but we thank you for your time. Uh, as we move to the second hour, I know there were several questions that we did not pose that uh, really dealt with antibody. And I thought they would be better to really save till after our uh, next speaker talks. Uh, he is Dr. Uh, Heath Dameron, uh, and he is uh, a fabulous uh, collaborator. Um, he uh, actually leads the vaccine center here, and his past focus has been to understand pertussis infections and to develop next generation vaccines. But along came the COVID epidemic, and he has in addition to pertussis, really applied his knowledge to really uh, look at immune responses, uh, what is the implication for vaccines, and he's going to talk to us today about some of his work with SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. He? All right. Thank you very much, Sally. Pleasure to be here. I'm over here. There I am. I'm tall. <laughs> That's okay. I'll stay right here. Uh, to tell you about our work with SARS-CoV-2 and what we know about what happens in humans in regards to antibody responses. And what we're trying to do is learn from what this virus does in people and apply that to potential vaccine strategies. And we all know that there are some vaccines on the way, but the theory is in the long run, there's going to be a need for a number of vaccines, both for the United States and Europe, but the rest of the world. So hopefully we can blend these together and answer some questions for you. So Dr. Fauci obviously brought into the equation the ACE2 receptor, which is what the virus uses to actually enter cells. But specifically, the virus uses this surface protein called the spike protein, which allows it to interact with the receptor. And within that receptor is a region, or within the spike rather, is a region called the receptor binding domain, and that's what physically interacts between the two. Within the virus, there's also a protein called nucleic acid of particular interest because it protects the genome and forms a large amount of the actual protein that the virus has. And so we in the immunology world consider these antigens, meaning proteins, that a human or animal uh, would develop an antibody response to or an immune response in general. So I'll be telling you a good bit about spike and RBD and nucleocapsid. So that's your uh, one slide of immunology. Oh, I, I, I was just kidding. There's actually another slide of immunology that's a little more complicated. <laughs> um, so when the virus attaches and replicates within cells, uh, you have inflammation due to, to tissue damage and et cetera. And the proteins then get picked up by immune cells called dendritic cells that lead to ultimately through a lot of cellular processes and then the host will make antibodies. 
But what's interesting is the host makes antibodies early on uh, through a less specific response and you get the best antibody you can in a hurry, but over time, the host will make better antibodies. And I'm gonna tell you about this, how this occurs through lymphoid tissue, through follicular responses and a more coordinated effort. But let's just stick with virus infection equals antibodies. And since everybody's an immunologist these days, everybody probably already knows that. So moving along, um, we needed to study how people are actually responding to infection. And so Ted Kiefer in the Dartmouth Pathology uh, worked out a way for us to acquire specimens across the timeframes of infection. And so what I need to point out is all the patients in our data set are mild to severe COVID and they were hospitalized. Dr. Alex Horsfall is a talented postdoc who actually developed what we call ELISA assays, which is simply an assay that allows us to count how much antibody is in a specimen. And so this is uh, a set of 500 specimens across 80 patients. Within those patients, uh, 70 survived and 10 did not. And what you see is early on, um, you have a lot of negative samples here. This is in, works out for all three sets. And as you see the red, those are COVID positive patients. And then on the axis here, you have the amount of antibody we produce. So in general, it works out that infection results in antibody production. And so when you look at this graph, it really looks like, well, everybody makes antibodies. Um, but when you start looking at individual people, it becomes a lot more interesting. Uh, if you'd like to look at more data associated, there's a, a link here at the bottom we can provide later. So which antibodies each person makes seems to have some role in what happens to them. And so we noticed this alarming amount of nucleocapsid antibodies produced in patients that did not survive. On the, and so we started wondering what could be going on there, and we don't really have a very good answer, but when we average all of the data that we have so far, the ratio of antibodies to the protein that's inside versus the protein that's outside of the virus predicts with about a two-fold increase in that ratio. And so if you look at a person who survives and a person who does not, this is the ratio we see in their antibody over time. And so in purple at the bottom, that's a person that survived COVID infection. You see very few antibodies to the nucleocapsid. Those who do not survive ultimately have these massive spikes. And so what we think is going on is cellular damage, so cells blowing up and releasing virus, result in antibodies to the nucleocapsid. And those don't help you get rid of the virus. And so this is a problem. We're gonna to continue to work with our clinical friends and see if we can figure out ways that this could be implemented to thinking about grading out which patients are worse off than others. Um, and this is actually interesting is that these similar data have been uh, actually found by several other groups around the country as well. All right, so let's return to this crazy antibody thing so we can get a little bit more deeply into the what's going on behind everything. So I mentioned that there are a number of processes down here at the bottom um, that result in antibody production. And these are, are your long-lived antibodies, meaning that they're made for a long time. And these are response is that if you come in contact again, you ultimately would be protected. So the question is always out there, will people be protected when they've been infected? And the answer is we still do not know across the board. Obviously antibodies can do some good, but that is still something to figure out. However, very important to us is we would like to know how long the immunity lasts and specifically how can we think about grading out how each person's responding to the infection. And so down here, I'll preview to you, there's a cytokine produced by one of these cells. It's called CXCL13. And it tends to proceed when antibody responses are massive and larger. And so we decided to go into the patients to see what we could find. So when we look at our patient population, uh, the CXCL13 amount is here in blue. And we can see that in blood, CXCL13 comes up before the patient makes a lot of antibody. Uh, and that's true for the nucleocapsid here, which tend to, people tend to make more of it about 21, 22 days post um, when they get infected. And at the bottom, most people make antibodies to the spike first. So then when we look at a single patient at a time, not just all of them at once, you can see mild patients don't have very much CXCL13 production or antibody. 
the patients with severe COVID show higher amounts of it. And we think that means that the body is attempting to produce more antibody to get rid of the virus. So CXCL13 data probably lets us know which people would have stronger, longer lived responses. So what we decided to do is think about how this applies to vaccines. And as we know, there's a number in phase two and phase three clinical trials. Here's 179 you can look up if you really want to study up on them. Uh, but there's a couple of things that have alarmed me personally. One is that outside the United States, certain COVID vaccines will be very challenging to implement, such as cold chain compliance or cost. Um, and then number two, an issue that I think is important is that there's very little emphasis on vaccinations in children, albeit we know that they do get the virus, they do pass it along. And most of our vaccines um, that we provide to people are to children. And so we decided to take an approach here and think about this. So we worked for a long time on pertussis vaccines and trying to improve them. So our first hypothesis, could we actually provide a dual combo vaccine? And our second hypothesis, can CXCL13 be used as a biomarker to identify strongly protective vaccines? And so here's a lot of colors and shapes and stuff, but I'll walk you through it carefully. So we went to mice and we started with taking vaccines such as the whole cell pertussis. This is a whole bacterium. And then we use the United States version, which is the DTaP, which contains no bacteria, just the proteins. And then we play with some novel adjuvants. So then we used our ribosome or RBD uh, protein and then fused it with a carrier protein as well to increase immunogenicity. And then we provide this to mice in both a nasal or muscular immunization. And so when we highlight and look here, this is an example of a vaccine that first administration, we had antibody, second administration, we had more. And then we look at the amount of CXCL13 produced, it's actually very high. And then when we go in and look at the ability of those antibodies to interact and block the receptor binding, it works very well. And so we decided to continue moving on with this particular formulation. Our friend here, Avon Martinez, has been growing SARS-CoV-2 here at WVU. Uh, and we have a mouse model that has the human ACE2 receptor expressed inside its respiratory tract. And when these animals are infected, they will lose weight rapidly and over here, this should give you an idea of the amount of virus there in red, uh, that's severe pneumonia. And so we have this vaccine that we'll be testing. Um, and this particular one would not be a good candidate for the United States, but 70% of the world uses this base vaccine to protect children from pertussis, thereby a simple addition of one protein might actually allow it to protect against both pertussis and COVID. So with that, there's a lot of people to thank, um, and I'll get to that in a second, obviously, because I have a take home slide here. But as Clay mentioned, there's been a lot of partnership between the Health Sciences Center, W Medicine, and CTSI, and this has been fantastic, which has allowed us to develop new things. And our, um, we think our data is starting to indicate that the human responses tell us a lot about what might be particularly protective in, uh, as you move through the preclinical pre work. But ultimately, this point here at the bottom, we still have a lot to figure out. And so the people to thank, the scientists who've done a lot of the assay work, and I do not have all of them listed here, uh, great collaborators in Ted Kiefer, Pete Farrar, and Sally, who've allowed us access to specimens. Uh, and then WVU has been super supportive. Um, and ultimately, the people in biosafety and lab animals have helped us move from, we'd never studied this a few months ago, to we spend every day thinking about it. So I'll be happy to take some questions on antibodies or vaccines uh, when you're ready. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. There were two questions early on in the first session that had to do with uh, waning antibodies. Uh, there was a question that um, you know said that you know a small percentage of individuals in Wuhan actually had antibody, mm -hmm. and of course over the past couple of weeks there have you know, intermittently been, you know, sort of calls for a strategy just to get to herd immunity by infection. You know, based on, you know, what you're seeing in the lab, uh, what, what are your thoughts on those issues? So we were to revisit the kind of big graph with all the antibody there. Um, it's easy to point out that we've only looked at patients after about two months. 
Uh, we have a new study that we were looking at some patients from Southern West Virginia, and we can already see about half the people who had been infected about five months later, they seem to be a very low amount of antibody, which is what everyone else is seeing as well. Um, so I think the problem is, if you look back to Dr. Fauci's breakdown of disease manifestation, you have severe versus mild. Mild infection is not likely to induce enough inflammation to make long live antibodies. And that's the problem we're dealing with. So I'm not saying good, bad COVID is good. I'm saying that it's not sufficiently producing um, enough antibody that you would think would last. But only time will tell. And, and Clay, as the COVID czar, uh, we've had uh, folks call for, well, you know, let's do herd immunity and <laughs> not shut everything down. You know, what, what is your view on that? Well, no matter what Arv Sorari is telling, no, I'm kidding. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, herd immunity, I think from what Heath just presented and from what we're seeing is a very unlikely approach to be effective. And we know it's a, a very dangerous approach related to the number of lives that might be lost. Remember, for diseases with the reproductive value that COVID-19 has, then we would need about 70, that's seven zero percent of our population to have been infected and to be immune. We are speculating that about 10% of our uh, population has been infected at the most. Sweden that tried to do the herd immunity had 7% in their biggest uh, city, Stockholm. So we know that with what, 230,000 deaths so far, with 10% of the people, if you had to have seven times that to get 70% of the people, you might have seven times the number of deaths. And you got the added complication, which is what Heath just talked about, that we are seeing the people that are getting natural infection seem, at least a group of people, seem to be losing antibodies, which are immune, you know, sort of inhibitors of perhaps virus uh, ability to infect uh, ACE2 receptors and get into the cells, that we're seeing those go down at a relatively rapid rate. And we saw that in the UK as well, where they lost about 30% of their antibodies in about two months after the native infection. Now, I think it's important though to realize, and Sally, you're a better person to really address this or RF or, or Mike Edmund or other infectious disease people, but because native immunity wanes faster, doesn't mean a vaccine still can't be effective in maintaining some higher levels of, of, of antibody production. And that also may be the reason why we may need a couple, a booster dose of the vaccine as well. And I think likely we'll take the vaccine yearly as we you know, are taking others until hopefully COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 becomes more like other coronaviruses, not SARS or MERS, but ones that are just, you know, colds and, and seasonal. But, but I would defer to you guys about that. The other thing I just, I understand is that the antibodies go away faster and are produced less well in older people than younger people. So younger people are likely to keep the antibodies a bit longer and have a more vigorous response. Thank you. Uh, I think before moving on, we'll take one more question. It's from Dr. Uh, John Barnett, who is chair of the microbiology department. And he says, two articles in last week's science indicated that either reduced production of type 1 interferon or autoantibody against type 1 interferon uh, leads to more severe disease. Uh, Heath, would you like to comment and have you looked at interferon levels? Yes, we did actually look at interferon levels um, as a whole across all the uh, patient specimens, and they were really high in people that had the highest amount of antibody indicating high severity of disease. But we didn't separate them out categorically by different levels. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see if that pans out in terms of being a therapeutic option. Okay. Okay, thank you. I think we will now move to our second uh, speaker in this hour, and that is Dr. Brian Hendricks, who's an assistant professor in the School of Public Health. Uh, Brian is really been a mover and collaborator and uh, expert leader in geospatial analysis. And he is going to talk to us on some of his analyses as relate to SARS-CoV-2 testing in West Virginia. Thank you, Sally. Can you all hear me okay? 
Yes. Excellent. All right. Um, I'll just wait for my PowerPoint. There we go. Uh, before I begin, I just wanted to say what a what a pleasure it's been to serve the school um, and then also our state partners. Um, it's really been an opportunity of a lifetime to receive mentorship from um, Dr. Marsh and Dr. Hodder and many of our um, uh, state agencies. Um, which is pretty exciting for an early stage investigator. So I'm really, um, it's been an excellent opportunity. Um, so early on, Dr. Fauci showed slides um, with the cases per 100,000 of coronavirus in the United States uh, at the state level. And then he also showed uh, another map, which was a graduated symbols map um, with cases of coronavirus around the country. And you could see that the shades of color uh, between light and dark, and then also the size of the dots change depending on where you were in geographic space. For this reason, um, spatial methods are uniquely qualified to sort of give us an idea of uh, high-risk uh, communities and then also what populations might be particularly vulnerable to complement the public health response um, that the Secretary of Health and, and all of our state and local partners um, have been contributing to so much. Next slide, please. <clears throat> also sort of uh, alluded to by Dr. Lee and others, um, sort of until we get that vaccine, some of the main things that we can do are wear a mask and social distance. Social distancing is one of the um, most common ways that we can mitigate risk of infection and also lower financial impact um, on healthcare and then society uh, due to the pandemic. In fact, there was a working paper that came out of University of Chicago it said that the financial benefits of social distancing can reduce hospitalization mortality costs um, by nearly $8 trillion across the United States or around $60,000 per U.S. household. That's an enormous cost. The, the issue with that, though, um, which many have alluded to, is that while social distancing is, is uh, effective, different communities have differing abilities to do so. Uh, and these are impacted by social de determinants of health and sort of their distribution um, throughout the landscape. Others have talked about the fact that uh, risk for infection is higher uh, by race and ethnicity, also by social economic status, uh, and that risk for severe infection is associated with higher levels of comorbidities and pre-existing conditions. It's possible that these uh, adverse effects are exasperated in rural areas which experience longer than average drive time, physician shortages, food insecurity. Um, and so this could be severely impacting um, our risk of infection in West Virginia. Next slide. I wanted to take a moment um, to address the issue of diversity and risk for coronavirus infection. I think that this is a really uh, interesting topic because in so many papers so far in the literature, we have found that that you know African Americans and Black populations do have an increased risk compared to white populations. Um, and when you think about diversity, you don't often think about West Virginia or other states in Appalachia. So historically, you know, rural Appalachian states as West Virginia are, are, are not really something we think as highly diverse populations. Uh, in fact, the 2019 ACS. Um, indicated that approximately 3.7% of West Virginia's resident population um, was African American. Despite this lower diversity across the state as a whole, we know that there are pockets of communities that have much more diversity compared to the state as a whole. Um, if you could activate the, uh, the animation for the slide. So for example, McDowell County in the Southern coal fields of West Virginia has the second highest percent black population at 8.4%. Yet it is ranked as the most socially vulnerable county in West Virginia to COVID-19. Its score between zero and one lies at about a 0.94, so almost a one. So there is something to this idea of, of, of race and ethnicity uh, and risk for coronavirus infection. But I would caution investigators to just say that it's, it's, it's due to race, right? There are complex underlying factors, um, such as access to care, limited healthcare act, uh, access, um, social economic status, job titles, that sort of, um, or job statuses, I guess, that sort of impact whether someone cannot socially distance at the same level as perhaps their neighbors. And so 
This sort of spatial variation is why uh, spatial aggression techniques are so useful. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that other, other studies have been done using spatial methods and, and, and sort of latched onto this idea of, of diversity as a risk factor. Um, one of the collaborators for the study that we're talking about had done a county level analysis across the United States, uh, looking at sort of the progression from urban to rural areas and uh, percent population black was a, uh, a risk factor um, in, his, in, in their model. Um, he used a similar methodology to what we use here in terms of a, a Bayesian sort of spatial model, um, but it wasn't community level. And so it's, it's hard to plan interventions around large scale sort of analyses. Uh, we have another paper that sort of applied uh, this, this, this study by Malalo uh, et al was sort of the first study to look at sort of how, how accurate or how much better is the model fit when you do a non-spatial regression compared to a spatial regression. And they found significant model improvement, which was exciting. Um, and then the last article here sort of talks about the disparities in COVID testing and positivity at the community lo level, which here in this study was zip code tabulation area. Um, which was, is approximately zip code level. Um, they didn't do spatial analyses. They did non-spatial uh, regressions. But what they found was um, that percent black was a significant risk factor. And we'll talk a little bit about that study later. So the current gap is that no study to date employs these sort of like these spatial regression models to investigate trends in community level testing and positivity in rural states like West Virginia. So our objective was to identify those high risk communities and vulnerable populations. Um, for West Virginia in which testing uh, should be intensified. Um, next slide. I'll just quickly go over some of the methods, but I'd be happy to answer questions um, afterwards. Um, for the testing data that we use, we use zip code level PCR, um, COVID-19 tests from March to September 1st, 2020. Um, inconclusive tests were removed from the analysis and tests were aggregated such that we were looking at unique tests or unique persons and a person was positive if any of their tests had ever been positive, and then they were put into the negative bin if all their tests had been negative. So we realized that sort of looking at this from an ecological perspective, um, we lose some ability to do longitudinal analyses, but that's just one of the limitations of the study. For social determinants of health data, we look at the total population from in 2018, percent of the population black alone in 2018 from US Census, percent population food insecure, um, and the rural urban community area codes where uh, they range from zero to 10 with higher codes indicating more rurality. And then uh, the area deprivation index, which was really interesting. So it's actually, it was created in 2007 and it's from the University of Wisconsin. Um, and there are national level and state level indicators for this. We use the state level because we wanted to compare individual spatial units within West Virginia to other spatial units in West Virginia, not across the nation. For the statistical analysis, um, we used a hierarchical Bayesian model, uh, well suited for uh, count data. And there were two models that we did. We did one on the testing rate, which is the number of tests divided by the population, which is a census population per census tract. And we also did one for the positivity rate, which is the number of positive tests in a census tract divided by the total testing volume in that census tract. Next slide. I wanted to focus a minute um, or less on this area deprivation index. And it's because of, of, of all of the literature going out there that's saying that there are these social determinants of health that impact risk of populations. And many of the studies where these uh, are these SES, these social economic variables are being considered, they're, they're really just using about four to seven variables. Here, using this area deprivation index, we were able to look at, for example, percent white collar occupations, income disparities. We were able to look at crowding. Um, we're able to look at percent with a motor vehicle, families below the poverty line. So these 21 variables that are incorporated here give us a, 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 a better ability to adjust for factors that might be influencing the difference in risk between black populations uh, and white populations. Next slide. The results from the, regress the regression analyses. Um, so IRR stands for the incident rate ratio um, and the, the 95 credible interval is the sort of the, the um, comparator to the 95% confidence interval if you were doing 
um, more traditional spatial or more traditional uh, statistical analyses uh, where you would use p values and such. Um, but this is a Bayesian approach. We use credible intervals instead. In the testing rate model, uh, I've highlighted actually for both models the significant variables uh, in red. So quick to quickly draw your eyes to them um, because it's a, it's a short presentation. Um, and so for the testing model, we see that uh, food insecurity was very important. So the more food insecure the community was, the more testing had been done there. Uh, rurality, we see the same thing. With the, more, the more rural a community is, the more testing had been done there. For percent black population, see that it's below one, which indicates that the higher percent black a community is, the higher percentage of its population that is black, we see lower testing there. And then for the positive, positivity rate model, we see that only food insecurity and percent black population uh, are statistically significant, but those relationships, those associations that we saw in the testing rate model hold true in that um, there's more tests, there's more positives in places that are food insecure um, or more food insecure, I suppose. And then for the percent population black, we see lower, posit uh, lower positives in communities that have higher uh, percent black population. So the overall interpretation sort of for this table is that the results such that suggest that communities with more white residents living in remote areas had higher test volume and positivity. Um, and we'll talk about that in the discussion section. Um, next slide. The next slide shows the maps from the, the spatial regression model. And so at the top, we have two maps, which are the model fitted testing rate. So this tells you sort of the outcome for the model, the predicted rate. Um, and that's the shading of, of, or, uh, of the red um, colors, the dots. And then the percent population food insecure and the percent black population are the shading of gray in the map. So the first thing I wanna draw your attention to before we start talking about the interpretations on these maps is the fact that the testing rate maps, uh, the legend is inverse to the positivity map. And I did that on purpose. So for the model fitted testing rate, I wanted to bring attention to the areas that had low testing rates. So low testing rates are darker reds. Um, for the model fitted positivity rates, the higher the rate, the darker the red. So I wanted to draw attention to sort of two different facets here. And what we see overall is that higher testing communities um, that have higher percent food insecure and lower percent black population and more test positivity in communities which have higher food insecurity and lower black percent black population. So it's similar to the, it's the exact same thing as the regression results, but now you can sort of see the distribution over space. And so how these things are interacting with one another, which I think is, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So is a table, but I think that these maps really draw your attention to certain areas. It could be where you live or where you're from. It could also be where maybe you have satellite clinics if you're a clinician. Um, or where a lot of your patients are coming from. So this is why maps are so useful in our sort of response to COVID, but not only just COVID, uh, really any public health phenomenon. Next slide. So race as a significant predictor of coronavirus testing within communities was synonymous with previous research. So we're validated there. We found no significant association between our ADI, which stood for our socioeconomic status, and we found a negative association between percent black population test positivity. This is in contrast to previous studies. This is probably one of the most interesting pieces that, that you know, as, as I move forward, I try to wrap, wrap my head around, but there are potentially two reasons uh, and both are very important. Screening bias would be the first one. So historically we know that rural racial minorities have utilized health services less frequently than their white counterparts. This could mean that fewer encounters with black residents combined with overall lower testing rates in these uh, communities that have higher uh, black populations could obscure the true positivity in rural communities with higher percentages of black populations. So this could be sort of masking the true prevalence in these communities with higher percent black populations. The second potential uh, reason that we see a difference in our social, social economic status variable is the fact that Previous studies using socioeconomic status in their models really only used about seven to four variables. Here we're using 21, and we're adjusting for crowding and for occupation, not just income, not just uh, education. We're adjusting for whether they had a car, whether they had a telephone. So we're using sort of the, the full gambit to look at, you know, why, why is race associated um, with higher risk or lower risk? Next slide. 
So the key points from this study, this study provides new insights related to coronavirus testing coverage in rural minority populations. We have similar conclusions regarding racial disparities in testing with differing results on socioeconomic status and the um, this supports the notion that adjusting for disparities in income and education alone does not control for racial inequalities in healthcare usage or access. Um, as I mentioned, there are some limitations to this ecological approach, looking at data sort of at the group level instead of uh, individual and longitudinally. So we have limited ability to look at temporality. And so if there was some sort of time effect on these vulnerable populations in testing, we couldn't capture it here in this study. Also, um, you know, just sort of the general statement about testing data are potentially prone to misclassification, you know, if, if a specimen wasn't handled, was handled properly or stored or, you know, sort of a general statement about testing data. And then the other important thing is that there was targeted testing um, in limited numbers of communities, particularly those with universities. This could make it appear like some areas have much higher infection rates, given that approximately 20% of people with COVID are asymptomatic over the entire duration of the infection. Um, and I know that numbers sort of differ in the literature. Uh, you know, Dr. Fauci used an estimate that was 40% earlier. Um, this estimate of 20% is from a systematic review um, of a bunch of different articles looking at asymptomatic persons. And so the, the, the statistic that Dr. Fauci uses is in that article. Um, and it talks about sort of the length of time at which di different people are asymptomatic. So this is sort of 20% over the entire course uh, of infection. And sort of the last piece of this, which is probably the most important in my opinion, is the data to action. How is what we're doing sort of influencing the future? And I just like to, again, thank our, our, our state and local partners, our federal partners, and all of our leadership. Um, state, and helpful, state and local health departments are continuing to expand testing resources to, to, to these vulnerable populations. Um, findings from this study could help to target these high-risk areas. West Virginia has, uh, we have been uh, responding to the uh, higher needs in these risk areas for these vulnerable populations since the beginning, since we really, you know, knew that coronavirus was in West Virginia and was a thing and uh, impacting these populations. Again, um, we've done a great job, I think, in, in responding and, and applause to those people that are on the ground. Next slide. <clears throat> um, here are just some acknowledgements. So the, the project co-authors, um, uh, their affiliations, and then of course for project support. This, this project was supported by the National Institute's General Medi Medical Sciences uh, CTSI grant, and the content is solely responsible of the authors and, and does not necessarily represent the official views of NIH. Uh, and with that, uh, the next slides are just references in case uh, anyone would like to, to, to use some of these, uh, and that's it. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Hendricks, thank you. That was an excellent presentation. We're running a little short on time, so I would invite the audience, if they have questions, to email or, uh, you know, chat with uh, Dr. Hendricks directly. I just want to thank him. He is uh, an important member of our modeling team, which is part of the RADx uh, grant that we got that really will be targeting uh, testing in the state. So thank you. Moving to our uh, final speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Vic Finnamore is Director of the Human Performance and Applied Neuroscience Research Center uh, at the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute. Uh, and he has done a number of things, you know, really looking at state-of-the-art sensors, at uh, cognitive assessment as relates to performance, recovery, and resilience. And today, he is going to talk about uh, the work of uh, his work and that of his colleagues looking at data from wearables and cognitive assessment to predict uh, viral like illness symptoms. Dr. Finnamore. Thanks, Ali. I'm going to switch over the screen right now. Can everyone see that? Yes. Perfect. Um, I know. Um, Quick, real quick, Dr. Azai sends his regards as he was initially going to um, talk through this research. Um, however, he's giving a parallel talk right now um, to uh, focus ultrasound committee based on some of the work that we're doing with blood brain barrier opening using focus ultrasound for Alzheimer's disease. So um, 
So I'm going to talk, and obviously Dr. Zai's talk sounds more neuroscience-y than a neuroscience institute talking about viral infections. And I kind of want to explain what we're doing, a research project going on. It's still active right now. Um, I saw a handful of people signed in here are actually participants in the study. Um, so keep up with your app and supplying your data. Um, so two and a half years ago, when we came um, and started the Rockville Neuroscience Institute, we really created a, this framework. Um, really looking at a holistic integrated neuroscience approach where we're taking clinical data, pairing it with um, sensors like wearable technology, as Sally was just talking about, and putting it into our backbone of our data analytics. And how do we start gaining insights from that? And we're calling this kind of like insights into the human operating system. Uh, these are, you know, parts of the nervous system, cognitive functions, um, biological cycles that allows us to really pull all this data together from this integrated approach and really gain insights in health and wellness um, and disease states. And so any kind of time we're trying to understand the current state of a person and to really understand how do we improve them to be healthier. Um, and some of these components, you know, from the work that we're looking at with um, smart sensors and different ways to continually monitor people is really tapping into, you know, the autonomic nervous system. Um, as many of you know, these are, uh, the system that controls a lot of the vital organs, and that's just running in the background. Just like a computer has many components running in the background, um, tapping into this allows us to really understand that, that current state. Um, so, you know, so, and, and, you know, familiar with that is the, the sympathetic nervous system or the fight or flight. So when the body is under stress, either internally or externally, you have this fight or flight response. And there's responses to it, such as your, you know, eyes, your pupils dilate, um, your heart rate increases. And so with these sensors, we can kind of understand the current state of someone um, between the sympathetic or parasympathetic uh, tone. Um, additionally, with different devices, we can start understanding cognitive and behavioral functions, you know, using uh, smartphones and uh, sensors on there. And then with that, also sleep and other circadian rhythms and biological cycles. So putting all that together, we really can understand the, the, the state of someone and the directory that they're going on to really help um, intervene. Um, and this kind of the setup right here is, you know, again, putting smart sensors on someone, monitoring them longitudinally, and really gains into this insight. Again, the autonomic care system, understanding heart rate or heart rate variability um, and the trends there, sleep and circadian rhythms, uh, function movement, um, physical activity, how people interact with that. And then again, cognitive functions by looking at different gamified apps that we put on and assess the current state of someone there. And then, you know, different questions and context that we could we drive. And so, you know, instead of having someone have to come to a clinic or, you know, every visit they come in and you get this insight, we could, you know, deploy these technologies on our patients and our population and continue and continually monitor them. And that's really where the key part of our, you know, data analytics and uh, data science really gains that insight from there. And so this framework is what we've developed over the last two years in a number of different populations, um, from really healthy individuals, from athletics to the military, which stems from a lot of the work from myself and colleagues who came from the Air Force Research Labs, um, to uh, patient populations. So understand, again, these boundaries of people who are in chronic pain and how different treatments can uh, change that state. Or um, our opioid addiction um, treatment is trying to model and understand the stress related to increased cravings. So we can model that. Um, and then it goes into infection. Because we've you know, collected data on all these people over the last couple of years, we've gained some really anecdotal evidence and insights from when people did get sick and seeing how these changes change, um, or these physiological changes um, move, change there. This is an example of actually myself. Uh, early January, I got sick. And you can see my heart rate variability which a uh, decrease in heart rate variability is a sign of stress. And so you see, as I, you know, lean into actually feeling sick, there's changes in patterns there. Same thing with sleep patterns and respiratory disruptions. Um, as you know, there's all these other ways that, you know, could stress the body out and have different patterns. An example is looking at um, in February uh, during the Children's Gala. Um, this is alcohol effect on my body uh, using the same sensors. And you can see, yes, my heart rate variability dropped to around 20 uh, for both, but the patterns of change uh, are very dis uh, different. And so those are the key elements that go into our machine learning model 
to understand these key pattern differences allows us to start predicting the onset of different infections. So taking these insights um, into, you know, April when, or, you know, really March when we start seeing people getting infected with uh, coronavirus, we, you know, say, hey, how can we take our framework and flip it over to really help monitor people? And so, you know, this is the same story we've seen that, you know, people get infected, you know, they really, um, in the asympathetic phase, you know, stage is where they're really contagious. And, you know, before they have any onset of symptoms, we want to try to identify that beforehand. Because we do that, we can help spread, you know, uh, the spread of uh, that disease. So again, these key pieces of can we use our integrated neuroscience framework using these wearable technologies to detect um, and predict the um, and viral infection um, in the, in the asymptomatic phase, as well as how do we use these tools to really help um, provide right decision-making support for help with reentry into work and school and has people make these decisions day to day. So we rapidly put together a protocol, and in April we, you know, started deploying this to our uh, health workers at Ruby Hospital, uh, providing them uh, smart rings and what uh, and uh, apps on their phone to track that. Um, quickly after that, the National Guard, who we partnered with in a number of different studies, are were also interested in this. So we were able to uh, deploy this to National Guards, and actually we're still doing this as they roll into different phases there. And then just recently, um, we started another cohort with university faculty and staff um, and um, really learning how we provide feedback and understanding the use cases along that. So it's been a you know, crazy couple months as everyone imagines just trying to deploy this study that you know, we were not planning at all and then rapidly rolling out and understanding you know, how we can monitor um, for this viral infection. And so again, we you know, are taking these four components uh, using the wearable sensors and technology to understand heart rate, heart rate variability, temperature deviations, uh, respiratory differences, sleep and movement patterns. And as if you're tracking the news on wearables, there's tons of articles out there um, between Aura, which is the smart ring that we've partnered with for the last two years from them, to WHOOP, which is other risk-worn devices, Fitbit, all these other studies looking at how we can monitor um, people's health and wellness with the use of wearables. Um, we have our cognitive app that understands the cognitive um, just assessments that we check in with people. And we do kind of a, um, it's a attention and fatigue task. As you imagine, you, you all know, you know, when you're sick, you do not, your attention wanes and it's distracted and you have that cloud around you, but we have this test that goes out there. Um, funny thing about this, going into some of the literature, I found an article that my PhD advisor published years and years ago, um, looking at people's effects on attention and fatigue on the same task um, with people um, infected with common cold. So um, he'd be proud that I found that. It was just a small little paper he published years and years ago. Um, and then we're also using biomarkers. So we are actually doing, um, swabs to really try to confirm that, um, the presence of different viruses and how we can look at that specificity um, in our um, modeling. And then the app itself also does a number of questions of tracking symptoms, looking at health and wellness, um, different encounters, uh, daily workload and stress, all components of a person that we sure that, you know, we can look at their health and wellness. And so, um, the initial model that we um, just submitted for publication now uh, has a, a first part of that cohort that we really dug into that essentially has 864 participants, um, over 75,000 days of data. Uh, we have over 3,000 unique uh, symptoms reported from people and um, a little over two, 250, you know, 289 people who were labeled as suspicious of having viral-like um, symptoms or illness. So some of the approaches to this modeling is first is we need to, we have all these people pr providing these symptoms and we need to understand which ones are actually leading to a viral-like symptom or illness or what are not. And so we use a lot of our clinical uh, team, Sally, uh, Clay, our major components of this. And we basically build rules 
of what are the symptoms that people are reporting and you know the the duration of these reported symptoms and the likelihood that that person does have a viral like illness or not and it starts allowing us to bend these into suspicious or not suspicious categories we take that um, in these two different bins now and we have all the data from the wearables um, and the app and the cognitive task and we run our machine learning models on that and looking at these pattern changes, kind of sort of the pattern of me getting sick in January, and we look at all these different combinations, we come up with over 50 rules to really start separating between the suspicious group and non-suspicious group. We now take, you know, 75% of that data, we train it, a model, so we understand if, you know, your physiological uh, sim uh, signals look like X, your cognitive scores start trending this way, you fall in these two big buckets. And then we validate that. Um, that's going to talk some of the data on the validation. So the validation is done on 25% of the data that was not included in training. So it really allows us to understand uh, this new data coming in and how our model performs that way. Again, these are different, the labeling model, the physiological model, and then we also take external variables and add that into the symptom onset um, model here. And so the outcomes of this, so we're really looking at what are your likely likelihood of developing viral-like symptoms um, or not in the, within the next three days. And the accuracy of this model is around 82% in correctly classifying you as likely or not likely of uh, developing viral-like symptoms. For the, the positive recall, and this is for all the people who are that truly have viral-like um, symptoms, we're 79% accurate in detecting them and put them in that bucket. Now, we've been playing with a lot of these thresholding of how we're classifying it, and for the positive precision, um, in order to not to make a lot of false negatives, um, we, we were a little bit more conservative how we're, we're classifying people. So there were 34% accurate in, um, in, in the forecasting of people who, people who are in the red saying high likelihood of developing viral symptoms who actually um, will develop symptoms in the next three days um, in order to, again, avoid having any missed um, events there. Um, whereas our negative precision of correctly identifying people who are low likelihood of developing symptoms is at 97%. So again, this is a, a paper that we, are, we just submitted for publication and one of our initial models that we have developed. And, um, Early in the month, we uh, release this out to a handful of our participants. So now we're providing this as a decision-making tool, not as not a diagnostic tool, but a decision-making tool that people can look at and based on these models with these known probabilities of um, detecting the likelihood of developing these symptoms of how people will use this data. And so we're getting a lot of feedback from people to really refine this and to understand how people use this as a um, a personal tool. In addition to this personalized tool based on your physiology and the, uh, your performance on the cognitive task, we also are providing dashboards to some of our uh, stakeholders so they can understand the trends of different onset of symptoms, the locations where people are from our partners, as well as the growth of different symptoms. And um, so we have different symptom stacks we have the, mod, or the outcomes of our model of who is likely of developing symptoms versus who are, is not, um, as well as some flags from the physiological data and then some COVID specific ones. So again, providing data and information back to our stakeholders so they can understand different trends as um, you know, people are using the app and the smart rings and seeing you know, how this can be a useful tool to really help counter and you know, understand different spreads. So with that, we have a number of ongoing projects with now that we pushed out the um, forecasting model and made it live is that we're instead of the retrospective validation, which we've done with that first cohort, now with all the other added people in our, um, in our study is now we're actually validating it with them by calling them checking in with their symptoms as they develop um, days after uh, the model says that they may come up down with a viral illness or symptoms. And this, again, this, all this is going into helping refine and increase the performance of these models that we're developing. 
We're also doing a number of different viral swabs um, in the next couple weeks to really hone in on people who have been, you know, reported as being sick and understanding how do we really increase the sensitivity and specificity of our model to detect um, and maybe, you know, this is our hope is distinguishing between maybe uh, different aspects of um, viral illnesses that are more severe. And then lastly, uh, looking at different modeling approaches. This is a, um, a multi-spectrum uh, temporal and spectral diagram of all the physiological sensors. And it comes up through really, really nice modeling of, you see these nice patterns. These are someone healthy. Again, these are all from various combinations of heart rate, sleep, movement, cognitive functions are, are on their task. And then, you know, you see the very different pattern change with this um, from someone who um, is not feeling well. Again, you see, you know, from day one, day two, this goes in, you start seeing um, patterns looking like this starting to generate and generate um, the next day later. And then third day, that person actually reported symptoms and they are not feeling well these two days. And so as we're tracking this, we can maybe use this as another way to really hone in and predict when um, viral-like illnesses are affected. And again, approaching it from this holistic uh, neuroscience approach there. So these are all, again, all active, ongoing um, uh, projects uh, looking at the, you know, with the co current cohort of people that are using our technology and we're monitoring them to help them keep safe and provide information back to them to, you know, you know, maintain, uh, you know, distance, you know, uh, quarantine when they need to. When, um, and so again, preventing the spread from there. And so this is the team right here that's really been, um, you know, digging into this and understanding how we use this data to provide the right information and um, uh, provide a nice tool to aid in this crazy times that we're all living in. So with that, thank you. I know we're running out of time. Um, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me or if you're interested in participating in the study. Uh, Vic, thanks very, very much. Uh, we have two minutes. I guess I have one question. So the, the deal is, you know, if you are predicted to have symptoms in the next three days, and I think it's important to realize these are folks that don't have symptoms, that, you know, then it's predicted for three days in the future. Actually, one in three will actually get those symptoms, right? Whereas the negative predictive ability is quite good. If, you know, if you're in the green, you have a 97% chance of being in the green. And I, my question is, what are you doing? That's conservative and that's good because, you know, you're really keeping people out of circulation who may develop viral-like symptoms. Are you doing anything specific to try to improve that positive predictive ability? Uh, you want to comment on that? Yeah, no, th yeah, thanks, Sally. Um, so exactly. So trying to really define what does that pattern look like. So if we have very clear, you know, understanding of what those patterns look like beforehand that end up with people that have um, flu-like um, illnesses being developed, um, and we're doing that by calling people. And so a lot of that is really honing in on these are, you know, really true people who are getting sick. These are not. And we're hoping through that um, understanding and separating out, we can really find and start clustering around that these are the patterns of, of you know, what we call sick and what we do not. Um, and not just relying on self-report, but really providing on the clinical insights and going into there. And, you know, even, you know, again, uh, clustering them out even more to hone in on that and improve um, the, the positive precision of identifying someone when they are uh, red or high likely of developing viral-like symptoms that they actually will and trying to increase that um, from 34 much higher. Um, and a lot of that is that we can now shift our threshold and not to have to be so conservative again. So um, we identify those people versus letting people go out in the wild and making that false um, negative prediction. Great. Um, well, Dr. Fenimore and uh, Dr. Damron, Dr. Hendricks, thank you very, very much. I think that, that folks uh, really, uh, every time I hear the presentation, all the cutting ed edge work that's going on here relevant to COVID, it, it's really gratifying. So thank you so much for your work, for your time, for your presentation. This concludes our second in-focus session. 
we look forward. Uh, we will be having subsequent sessions, though I can't believe it's almost November. So please look forward to our announcements, which we anticipate the next session will be after the first of the year. Thank you so much.